presidential hopeful makes a campaign trip to South Dakota looking for support next on KDLT News. And now, 5 News at 10. Your news tonight with Sherry Kurtz and Ben Boyette. Good evening again, and thanks for joining us. The death toll tonight in the continuing search through rubble of what used to be the Oklahoma City Federal Office Building is now at 52. The search was slow going today and stalled for a time for reinforcement of the wreckage of the nine-story structure. The FBI today released sketches of two men wanted for questioning. The two reportedly rented a truck that possibly carried a half ton of explosives that blew up the building yesterday morning. The FBI says it has many good leads with good substance, but no arrests yet. Tonight, a third man wanted for questioning returned to Washington aboard a British Airways jet. He was detained in London while en route to Rome. And tonight also, three police officers were shot in Haddon Heights, New Jersey. At least one, possibly all three, died during a confrontation with a suspected child abuser. The two police officers and a prosecutor's investigator were shot allegedly by a man barricaded inside a house. The shooting happened as the officers tried to search the suspect's home for weapons. The police earlier received a report that a three-year-old living in the house was sexually abused. The bombing of that federal building in Oklahoma City forced federal officials around the country to reevaluate security measures. Those extra steps are even in place in South Dakota's federal courthouses. Cammy Melton tonight talks with people at the federal courthouse in Sioux Falls about the changes. It was a blast like no other this country has ever seen. An estimated 2,000-pound high-powered explosive blew a 30-foot crater in the ground and turned part of this federal office building into a heap of debris and concrete tomb. And this isn't in New York or D.C., but central USA. It makes you realize that if these things can happen in a, f a fairly small city such as Oklahoma City, uh, certainly it could happen anywhere else. And for that reason, federal courthouses across the country, South Dakota included, have been ordered to be on at least a heightened level of protection. Security at the federal courts building in Sioux Falls has included surveillance cameras, metal detectors, and security officers for the last 10 years. But this increased level of awareness has never been here. Paying a lot of closer attention to people coming in, what they're carrying with them. And even after the devastating explosion yesterday, workers here feel that's enough. A little concern for... Everyone in Oklahoma City, I think, probably most. Um, not a lot of concern about my own safety because I feel that the Marshal Service here does a real fine job of watching out for all of us here. We feel safe out here and we don't think it can happen to us, but it has gotten a lot closer than we ever thought it would. So people are a little leery today, uh, and you know, rightfully so. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure there are. Even my daughter was concerned. And I can understand why. And like in Oklahoma City, U.S. Marshal officials here say there's nothing they could do to prevent a similar explosion in the future. And that's because the bomb that exploded in Oklahoma City was inside a car parked in a public parking spot right in front of the federal offices building. So all federal workers can do now is join the rest of the country in waiting, waiting for answers to this senseless destruction as two more search and rescue crews move in to continue the search for bodies that could take up to six days. Right there. In Sioux Falls, yeah. Cammie Melton, KDLT News. One of the so far top contenders for the Republican nomination for president, Texas Senator Phil Graham, told us today he expects to win the South Dakota primary next year. Graham, who says he... ...a spark, and that spark is what leads to the lightning channel that forms at the base of the cloud and then extends down to the ground. So relatively simple. If you can get a positive charge in the upper part of the cloud, negative in the bottom, and you can form lightning. That does often occur. And if you are in the way of lightning, if you're indoors, you should always avoid telephones, all electrical appliances. Don't shower during a storm. Anytime you're messing with water during lightning, you are prone to being struck. Stay away from all windows. And, of course, if you're outdoors, don't be near the tallest object. That's been known for many years that you don't want to be near trees, anything metal at all, because it certainly can get struck by lightning. And don't play with any type of softball equipment like metal bats and also... Of course, those golf clubs aren't the most susceptible. Many people get struck every year on golf courses. Don't go near water, and please, always try to avoid lightning, avoid going outside if there's any way possible when there is a lightning storm. On the satellite vantage point, we have clouds that are sticking around. Even Chamberlain, Fort Thompson, and out farther west. 
Tri-County Electric says its damages will be about a half a million dollars. Owahi Electric tabs the loss at 400000 For many residents of central South Dakota, it may be several more days before power is back on. Another day and more floodwaters rising across the Sioux Empire. The places coping with the inundation are too numerous to count, and it's beginning to look like the days that began that disastrous series of floods in the spring and summer of 1993. Ted Coffey visited Brookings County today to see how additional rain is sparking a whole new round of flood worries. Under normal conditions, you can barely see the Big Sioux River from this hill south of Brookings. Today, water is about all you see. Most streams, lakes, and rivers in Brookings County were expected to crest sometime last night. But then today, it started raining again, virtually nonstop. And for many, flooding here has become more than a typical springtime nuisance. Okay, you've got an emergency. Take care. Jack Otto owns a farm near Sinai. One look at his yard tells the story. He can't get to most of his buildings anymore. They've been swallowed up by Lake Sinai, which normally spans about 640 acres. Today, the lake has swollen to three times that size, and Jack's farm is going under. Otta says Lake Sinai has actually been rising for the last 10 or 15 years. In 1993, the farm flooded so badly that he and his family moved out. But this spring, says Jack, is the fastest he's seen the water encroach on his house. I use it as an office uh, night farm and, and do some research plots. So uh, I think this is about the last week, though. I think everything's going to go. I think the basement will fill up after this. and uh, It just isn't going to be livable anymore. Anyway. Just down the road, indifferent floodwaters threaten to make the town of Sinai less livable. City workers are hauling rock and dirt around the municipal sewage pond, trying to keep rising waters off the electric panel, controlling their sewage pump and lift station. If it goes under, sewage will back up into homes here. Even driving in Brookings County has become difficult. We've got several township roads that are closed with water over them. We've got uh, a couple county roads that are closed because of water. Uh, we have several that have water on them, but we do keep them open uh, for minimal travel. And if the rain continues, minimal travel, even on major highways like US-14, won't be possible until the weather dries out. In Brookings County, Ted Coffey, KDLT News. It hasn't taken Mother Nature too long to put the 1994 Federal Crop Insurance Reform Act to its first test. Widespread flooding throughout most of the farm belt in 1993 prompted Congress to do away with disaster payments, leaving instead beefed up crop insurance and deficiency programs. The deadline for farmers to qualify for this year's farm program is one week from tomorrow. If producers haven't purchased private or federal crop insurance by that time, they will not qualify. An estimated 1,500 rain-soaked farmers in Minnehaha County are expected to be in this year's program, but they won't be looking at the kind of help they received following the disaster of 93. Most of that year's crop was in the field and growing when it was washed away. The inability to put the planter in the fields this season makes next Friday's farm program deadline all the more important. There is provisions if they don't get anything planted, there is a couple options. They can go, if they're signed up in the program, they can go to the 092 program and receive their deficiency payment, which is not a lot of money, but they can get deficiency payment on that 092. And there would also be a small federal crop insurance payment. But you're talking uh, not a lot of money, uh, bare essentials probably, uh, by participating in both the minimum federal crop and the 092. Producers who meet next Friday's deadline will have until June 30th to change their mind and cancel out of the program. And Rob... Perfect time to buy a new DeVille, because right now is spring savings time at your local Cadillac dealers. Get your hands on this great deal, up to $5,400 off when you purchase a new spring edition DeVille. $5,400. The beautiful spring edition DeVille includes chrome wheels, leather seating, and gold ornamentation. But hurry, Cadillac Spring Savings Time ends soon. Visit your Cadillac dealers, your luxury leaders, today. Later on the Tonight Show, find out what makes Judge Ito's hands so touchably soft. With a special room team of moisturizers, nutrients, and emollients. Plus three cheers for Kirstie Alley. Saturday Night Live's Al Franken, country superstar Clint Black, and Jay get a makeover. NBC Tonight. 
5 News at 10 continues. On Monday, Air Vantage will cease passenger commuter service in North and South Dakota and in Minnesota. Air Vantage, which makes small trips to several South Dakota cities, including Sioux Falls, says it has significant additional freight and courier volume now and can no longer stay in the passenger business. Air Vantage says anyone holding tickets, whether refundable or non-refundable, can get reimbursement or perhaps transfer to another airline. It seems like only yesterday, but tomorrow the ecology movement in America will officially be 25 years old. Tomorrow is the silver anniversary of Earth Day, which led to our many environmental laws and regulations that, though not always popular, undoubtedly are responsible for making our world a cleaner place. Cammie Melton tonight reports on how far we came in 25 years and how far we have yet to go. Joyce and John Rise are thankful that they don't have to go far to enjoy nature. This park across from where they live always has plenty to see. We have a lot of birds. You get your... Uh... All types of wildlife. You even got deer here. This is what we need. When you see all those little kids up there in the swings and stuff, it's beautiful. And the mamas or the babysitters or whatever bringing them there, they need outside too. The Rices, like many people, hope we all stop and think tomorrow about preserving these natural habitats. Tomorrow is Earth Day 1995, the 25th anniversary. It all began here with America's first Earth Day on April 22, 1970, when 20 million people demonstrated against polluting the environment. Before this day, protecting nature was not something people talked about. But 25 Earth Days later, things have changed. There's been an increased awareness of how to live in harmony with nature. That's making a difference right here in South Dakota. It has been decades since bald eagles have successfully reared young in the state. In the last two years, we've uh, raised, I think, bald eagles have successfully reared um, two clutches in the state. So things like the Endangered Species Act have worked. But there are many challenges that are still ahead, the greatest of which is to find a balance between our needs and the needs of nature. We need to find a way of a living in our environment, whether it's the Black Hills or the Eastern Prairies, or the state of South Dakota or the Midwest or the world in a way that uh, leaves something for those folks coming after us. And in order to do that, Earth Day must not only be celebrated tomorrow, but become a lifestyle, realizing that the way we live our everyday life affects the environment we live in. In Sioux Falls, Cammie Melton, KDLT News. Today was the day parents registered their kids for kindergarten in the Sioux Falls schools and to make the trip from carefree kit to student life a little easier, there was a mini train at Annie Sullivan Elementary today. After registering for, registering for school, the students-to-be took a tour of the school by train. Get there, bring them down to their room and they enjoy that and they'll, they'll remember it and they like the, the school here very much. So I think it's really helpful for the kids for coming there. They'll be looking forward to coming here. They're bombing all just ahead on CNN Weekend. Mika Student Assistance. Stories and more next on KDLT News. Sioux Falls authorities tonight are on the lookout for a suspect in an early morning abduction and rape. According to police, a 43-year-old Sioux Falls woman reports being kidnapped from the area of 41st in Minnesota at a convenience store this morning. A black male reportedly forced the woman into his car, beat her repeatedly, drove her to an unknown location and raped her. The woman told police the, assail uh, the assault began at about 12.15 this morning and continued until she was released near 41st in Minnesota once again about 2 a.m. The woman is recovering tonight from multiple facial and head wounds, including bruises, cuts, and abrasions. The assailant is described as a 25-year-old black male, about 5'9 to 6 feet tall, weighing about 200 pounds. The suspect has short black hair, a mustache, and goatee. He was driving an older model large car, possibly a four-door Buick with possible maroon vinyl interior. Sioux Falls police are asking anyone with information about this case or possibly someone who recognizes the description to contact them. One of South Dakota's only two men on death row is asking the state's high court to overturn his murder conviction. In Pierre today, the state Supreme Court heard three hours of arguments from the attorneys for Donald Moeller. Moeller is the man sentenced to death after being convicted for the 1990 rape and murder of nine-year-old Becky O'Connell of Sioux Falls. Moeller's lawyer, Mike Butler, argued his conviction should be overturned because the death penalty is unconstitutional. 
Butler also told the court today Moeller was denied a fair trial because the jury heard evidence about three prior sexual assaults he had committed. And fingers are pointing tonight, but it's too early for federal agents to know who is responsible for a letter bomb that killed a timber industry lobbyist in California this afternoon. An employee of the California Forestry Association apparently brought in a small package from outside the office, and when another employee attempted to open it, the package exploded, blowing out windows and doors of the small brick building. Federal investigators do not believe this bombing is related to last week's deadly bombing in Oklahoma. Meantime, the search continues tonight through the rubble of that federal building in Oklahoma tonight. More bodies have been found, perhaps as many as eight, according to fire officials. But rescuers will have to move about 300 ton of debris to free them. Tonight, Jim Hanchett tells us the White House believes the death toll will reach over 200. Marine Corps recruiting officer Randolph Guzman used to open the door to go to work. Today, searchers found his body in the bombed out federal building, still in uniform, sitting at his desk. Despite such ghastly discoveries, dogs sniffing for life and rescue workers removing rubble handful by handful are intent on reaching the ruined daycare center and social security office by day's end. It's tough to remain optimistic that we can open up an area like where these firefighters are right here, calling in an area there and have somebody alive. But that's one of the things that's got to keep these guys and gals going. The latest on the suspects now. The FBI reports John Doe, number two, is still at large. Timothy McVeigh's lawyers withdrew from the case today, citing safety concerns and urging any trial be moved to Denver. One of my primary concerns is that I had a number of friends who died as a result of the tragedy at the Murrah building. Brothers James Nichols of Michigan and Terry Nichols of Kansas are still being held only as material witnesses although there are news reports that Terry Nichols may be under arrest by week's end. And the FBI says it has some surveillance camera video of the bomb site, but once more. We are urging anyone with security video cameras, particularly those located in convenience stores and restaurants that were operating in the area near the time of the blast and have preserved that tape to contact the FBI hotline. And the burials have also begun. At this funeral home, services for three-year-old Kayla Titsworth, who went to the building with her dad. He was injured, but survived. Ricky Tomlin did not. He was at work on the phone when the bomb went off, killed in mid-sentence as he talked with his wife. The phone went dead, and Tina Tomlin wants the and same fate for her husband's killer. And I just pray to God that they pay. I want them to pay. I want them to hurt. I want them to suffer. And for the first time, there is beauty outside the building. Mums brought by the Alabama PTA for the children still inside. Searchers tonight have once again revised when they will reach the daycare center. They now believe it will be at least Tuesday before they can dig all the way through the three floors of pancake concrete still in their way. And the Sioux Falls Fire Department and the Firefighters Union Local 814 have set up a relief fund to help victims of last week's bombing in Oklahoma City. As of noon today, the firefighters started accepting donations through an account set up at Norwest Bank. They plan to continue taking cash donations through May 12th, when 100% of that money will go to a bank in Oklahoma City for distribution to the victims and their families. From the future of Social Security to student assistance for higher education, local residents spend today searching for answers. And floodwaters hit Davison County. We'll add up the damage Down a next on KDLV News. This weekend's all time. You're in the market for entered a letter of intent for the sale, but neither party is disclosing terms. Trail King employs 470 people in the Mitchell area, and it is the nation's largest manufacturer of specialized trailers for heavy equipment. Thompson says other than additional capital for ongoing expansion, the sale to Carlisle will not impact the Mitchell manufacturer. Recent rain and snow has caused the James River to again swell over its banks. This time, the river's weekend crest in the Mitchell area washed away a flooding record set just two years ago. But as John Austin reports tonight, the floodwaters of 95 so far have caused only minimal damage to that area. Down a couple inches today from this weekend's all-time high, the James River near Mitchell was still more than a foot higher than the record 1993 crest of just over 19 feet this noon. 
The river has swollen up to a mile wide and more along virtually its entire length from Aberdeen to Yankton. The record levels brought water and natural resources water quality sampler Pierre Bernard closer to his work than usual late this morning. This is the highest that I've ever seen it. It's without a doubt. Uh, it's it's uh, not even close to what it was in the 93 flood. East of Mitchell, Public Works personnel were scrambling to restore the city's only access to its sanitary landfill, which was lost late last Friday. We did have water on at 93, but it wasn't very deep, there, and it wasn't deep very long. We could, the trucks could easily pass through it then. And right now we've brought the surface up probably at least four foot. In spite of the record this year, damage along the perennially mischievous James has been mitigated by farms and small towns well used to the history of the troublesome floodplain. Basically all we've got right now, the river is at a record level at uh, 20.3 inches crested sometime uh, Saturday and Sunday. And uh, we're still looking at uh, basically some agricultural land being underwater, uh, a few isolated houses that uh, were both enhancing uh, Davidson County uh, on each side of the river that were affected, but uh, that's basically all we're looking at. The Weather Service says even if the rains do hold off, upstream North Dakota reservoirs on the gym are overflowing and will have to be released as the season progresses. The James River enjoys a distinction as being North America's longest unnavigable watershed and the slowest moving river on the continent. It will be a long time before it returns to its banks. Near Mitchell, John Austin, KDLT News. President Clinton is in Iowa tonight preparing for a summit on rural America. Arriving in Des Moines this afternoon after spending the morning in Minneapolis, President Clinton will take part in the state's farm summit tomorrow. He will also talk to students and the Iowa State Legislature. Concern over Social Security brought more than South Dakota senior citizens together in Sioux Falls today. This year marks the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Social Security Act into law, but as Cammie Melton reports tonight, many seniors are concerned the program does not have much of a future left. There's got to be something wrong with the system. Can you address that? Well, I... It's the question that's on nearly everyone's mind here today. How can Social Security and Medicare be reformed but not lost altogether as Washington lawmakers look toward reducing the federal deficit? Social Security is a program people paid for all of their lives, and they deserve the benefits now. It's and these South Dakota seniors agree. Do you have any concerns about losing Medicare or Social Security? Well, yes, I am, because I have to depend on it. There's all this talk about uh, entitlements and how it's a heavy burden on the government. After all, Social Security is paying its own way, and all of us who are receiving it, have paid into it for the years. But with a more than $4 trillion federal deficit, there's been a lot of talk about whether Social Security cuts should be part of the remedy. So the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare Executive Vice President and Congressman Tim Johnson are encouraging today's audience of more than 100 seniors to join them in their effort to put the security back into Social Security. They have to watch Congress very carefully. They have to be very, very well informed. They have to be very Vocal. Johnson was given a pair of boxing gloves symbolizing just how much help they'll need to end what some are calling an all-out assault on Social Security. In Sioux Falls, Cammie Melton. She was buried in the Black Hills National Cemetery. The South Dakota Highway Patrol closed several routes through the Black Hills today because of high water and runoff from flooding. The Highway Patrol also warned motorists in the hills to be on the lookout for landslides and falling rocks. Meantime, Governor Janklow said today he expects the impact on agriculture from the 1995 flooding to be huge. Janklow says time is running out for farmers to plant a crop, and the governor is preparing disaster declarations for at least 20 counties in South Dakota. The National Parent Teacher Association is celebrating this week as Teacher Appreciation Week. And tonight, Beth Fuller introduces us to a teacher who deserves quite a bit of appreciation, like she's been getting from several generations of students. She may not look it, but Lowell fifth grade teacher Marilyn Lee is celebrating 36 years of teaching. One of the nicest memories is when you see one of your students who has grown up and has become successful. And I have had some students in my class whose parents I had earlier, and that's been a really neat experience. Jim Stansberry is one of those parents. He has fond memories of his days in Miss Lee's classroom. I think that it's kind of neat that she's still uh, working and that, that uh, 
she's teaching my son, you know, maybe the same way she taught me. Um, I've got two little girls at home that are, are, are twin girls that had already decided that they wanted Miss Lee, too, when they got to fifth grade. But Jim's son, Anthony, will be the last Stansbury to have Miss Lee. She plans to retire at the end of this year. Her time's come to retire because she's had my dad, and that was a while ago. And she had a lot of other people's parents. So I guess she's probably doing the right thing. Although it may be the right thing for her, it's hard for her students to see her leave. It makes just everything fun. Social study, just all the regular subjects fun. When people are messing around and stuff, and she's just really in control. And so she has everything under control, and there's nothing really bad that happens or anything. So just going to be bad when she leaves. But even though this is her last year in the classroom, lessons learned from Miss Lee will be with these students for years to come. In Sioux Falls, Beth Fuller, News 5. Well, you might think that the child care profession is one that's been around forever, but actually it's 75 years old in America. Child care needs arose with the end of World War I when America suddenly found itself with hundreds of thousands of widowed mothers who had to go to work to support their children. One group that met the needs of those mothers is celebrating a 75th anniversary. Cammie Melton has the story. Sweet girl. When mom and dad can't be there, the strong, loving arms of a child care provider comes in a close second. Today, one of the oldest daycare centers in the United States is celebrating 75 years of caring. We're wonderful 75 years, and, and uh, we're uh, very happy about our rich history, and we look forward to, uh, uh, to another successful uh, 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 several decades uh, of service in front of us. What began as a means of helping widowed mothers go back to work after World War I has now become a necessity and one that Governor Bill Janklow says has made the country more productive and profitable. I used to work two jobs. I provided daycare in the afternoon and then I worked a full-time job in the morning. And it was really tough, but I was comfortable with it because I knew we had a good service going. But Volunteers of America is also using their birthday to honor those that are the best caregivers, mothers and fathers. The real, uh, the real heroes are parents who are with their children day after day um, with all those uh, uh, tough decisions that parents only can make. Over the last 75 years, the major change in the child care field has been the increased demand for this service. But the one constant, Barnett says, is a lack of funding. His birthday wish is that in the future they can celebrate the end of their financial difficulties. In Sioux Falls, Cammie Milton, News 5. In a moment, a look back on the day that came 50 years after the day that the world started to relax. VE Day plus 50 next on News 5. And Father Francis Sampson, an army chaplain who parachuted into Normandy, then into Holland, was wounded, captured, but managed to escape. In their bravery, and that of all their brothers and sisters in arms, America found the will to defeat the forces of fascism. And today, we, the sons and daughters of their sacrifice, say thank you and well done. I ask all the veterans of World War II now to stand and be recognized. Monsignor Sampson retired from the service 25 years ago and became a part of the Sioux Falls Catholic Diocese in 1977. 55 years ago today, the beginning of the end of World War II began as Germany surrendered on what became known as VE Day, or Victory in Europe. This afternoon, several men who were in uniform on VE Day gathered at the Sioux Falls Disabled American Veterans Club and recalled where they were at the time. They finally told me if we went, I got uh, back to the line, I, I escaped you know, to the line. That's yeah. how I knew found out, but they give up then. Well, we were, we were over in the Pacific and uh, we heard that there was, the war was over, but we didn't know anything about it because the Japanese were still going at us. There was good news in that. Yeah, it was really a joy. Why was it good news? Get this war over with. We all celebrated. We really celebrated our victory over there in Europe. Uh -huh. And I really was 
really oh. persist on that. I really like that. When I can get to say, hey, boys, we're uh, back and going to back to America again where we belong. Well, I was liberated from prison camp in Germany. And, uh, in fact, I was liberated on the 29th of April, but we couldn't leave the camp because the facilities weren't there to transport us. But 50 years ago today, we were flown from Landschlut, Germany, to Le Havre, France, to Camp Lucky Strike, where we were greeted by the Red Cross and our troops and a big celebration. We got eggnog to drink and started on rehabilitation. VE Day, 50 years ago today, marked only the end of the war in Europe. It would be several more months before VJ Day, or victory over Japan, and the complete end to World War II. VE celebrations moved from Paris to Berlin today as former foes gathered in one location after the end of the war in Europe. German leaders welcome members of the traveling summit as they arrived in Berlin. Vice President Al Gore represented the United States at today's commemorative event. German Chancellor Helmut Kohl stood with allied leaders as the German national anthem was played in honor of all those who gave their lives during the war. Tomorrow, world leaders gather in Moscow for another VE Day ceremony. DNA school began today in the O.J. Simpson trial in Los Angeles. The jury today played the role of students. For these jurors, this course is not an elective, it's a mandatory class. John Gibson has the story. It's like Mr. Wizard's smart daughter came to the Simpson trial. She is Dr. Robin Cotton, head of the Cellmark Labs, where DNA samples in this case were tested. DNA is two strands wound together she brought simple diagrams to this class, a cram course that is supposed to prepare the jury for an elementary examination on DNA. It shows there a series of gels and two power supplies up on... Eventually, the test results are going to have names, O.J. Simpson's and the two victims. And the prosecution is expected to say that Simpson's blood is at the crime scene, the victim's blood is in his car, and in his house. Simpson's side knows this stuff is both incriminating and boring. His lawyers plan to attack the DNA results on the basis of sloppy collection techniques that invalidated the results. The prosecution is anticipating that assault already. So this process of degradation, can it change my DNA into looking like your DNA? No. The defense is also expected to continue its conspiracy theory that results which incriminate O.J. Simpson are part of a plot to frame him. Here in Sioux Falls, it's not often that you find a place that's unique to the entire country, but we've done just that. It's a furniture store located in the Western Mall called Amnika. They're selling furniture there that's really turning heads, and tonight Scott Bowden shows us the store and introduces us to the man who's giving Sioux Falls a little taste of Europe. I like to make a travel to the United States and see this country. Yeah, it's, it's like my dream before. Now it's my dream come true, right? Yeah. Meet Vol Meshchikov. He's a Russian immigrant from a small republic called Estonia. He moved to Sioux Falls three years ago, and for the most part, he says he likes it here. The town is clean, the people are friendly, and he says everyone's eager to help him out whenever he needs it. In Sioux Falls, people, uh, people, sh people show me this place, what I'm looking for. Maybe they're they very busy, and people drive with me, and show me a place what I need. You know? Well, now Vo wants to give something back to the community. So he opened this furniture shop in the Western Mall called Emnika, and he's selling furniture that's turning people's heads. Some people just stop, like pushing the brake, push brake car, just stop and look around. Oh, uh -huh. I don't see this place before. And uh, something different, a lot of co lo lots of uh, colors, furniture. Uh, some people ask me, this is real leather? He says, yes, it's real leather furniture. Oh, okay. And some people sit, sit down and tell me, I don't understand why it's so comfortable. You know? It's comfortable, but have you ever heard of a president, a Nicole, or even a Yufa? Probably not. It's because these Finland designs are the only ones sold in America, but they'll cost you a pretty penny, 
some up to $3,600. But Vol's confidence these designs will sell. This is furniture, furniture it's very light. I think kids can move this furniture very easy. It's, uh, high, it's good quality wood, good quality leather. And um, I tell you again, it's, I think it's good design. <laughs> So whether you come to Amnika to look at the president, the Nicole, or just to check out the Yufa, Vol's hoping that he brings a taste to Europe right here to Sioux Falls. In Sioux Falls, Scapo News 5. Well, we may have some rock and roll in the skies overnight, huh? Yeah, this just in, a tornado on the ground just south of Omaha, about 24 miles. Mm. So severe weather this late at night. We have more rain to talk about in South Dakota, but there could be some severe weather. We'll explain it all after this. What makes a car dealer different? Announcing the results of Ford Motor Company's QCP serve. East of Brookings, again, March 2nd, 1995, taken by Chris Johnson. She is, he, or she is an SDSU student, and this was taken and sent to me, one of Cook's weather picks. Current conditions in Sioux Falls, cloudy skies, 56 degrees, 55 is our dew point. East winds at 16, and our pressure is now on the rise at 29.56. Before we get to the severe weather, let's talk a little bit about some rainfall totals. 2.6 inches just as the last hour in a 24-hour span in Aberdeen. There is an urban and small stream advisory for all of Aberdeen and the surrounding towns. So if there are areas where roads are covered by water, please do not try to cross them as your car can be swept away very quickly and sewers are backing up all around Aberdeen and surrounding communities. Pier 0.91 inches so far today in 24 hours and down to Sioux Falls about a third of an inch and Hill City in the western half of the state 3.06 inches of rain. We've had enough. South Dakota is fast becoming the land of 5,000 extra large ponds. 56 in Sioux Falls, 53 in Brookings, 50 in Watertown, 58 in Grand. Call Harold's Travel now to make your reservation. The Harold's Travel toll-free number is 1-800-605-TRIP. That's Harold's Travel, 1-800-605-TRIP. Call Harold's Travel now. Depending on our weather, Sioux Falls will be the site for two North Central Conference tournaments this week. Beginning on Thursday at Rock and Field, Augustana will host the NCC Men's Baseball Tournament. Here's a quick look at first-round pairings with Augie opening up against Northern Colorado Thursday afternoon at 4. The double elimination tournament runs through Sunday. Band beginning on Friday at Bowden Field right next door, the NCC Regional Softball Tournament with Augustana, the number one seed, and the tourney hosts. Augie finished second to Nebraska-Omaha over the weekend in the NCC Championship in St. Cloud. With showers and thunderstorms predicted in Chicago tonight, that's exactly what the Minnesota Twins could use after their 17th inning marathon in Cleveland yesterday. Young Pat Mahomes back on the mound for the Twins after lasting just five innings in his two previous starts combined. He takes to the mound tonight wondering, how do you win in the majors? And it's not like Frank Thomas is going to show him how. He says welcome to Chicago with a two-run shot to dead center field. Twins down 2 nothing in the first. Still in the first, Mahomes serving up batting practice. It's Warren Newsom with a solo shot. 3-0 pale hose after one. The Twins do score a run in the second and one more in the third, but lose again tonight from the long ball. 4-2 to two to, the, to Chicago. They face each other tomorrow once again. A quick check on the American League scoreboard. Cleveland blanks or shuts out the Kansas City Twins 6-2 and Texas leading Oakland. That one just underway. In Atlanta tonight, Coach Bobby Cox back in the dugout less than 24 hours after being arrested for a domestic dispute with his wife last night. Tom Glavin on the mound for the Braves serving up the long ball. Greg Jeffries, a two-run shot to begin the game down in Atlanta. Atlanta down two to nothing after one. In the second, the Phils will score again on Lenny Dykstra's single to right field. 3-0 Phillies. Atlanta scores twice, but it's not enough as Philadelphia wins their fifth in a row, 3-2 to two over Atlanta. Here's a check on the senior circuit scoreboard. 6-3, to three, Houston beats Pittsburgh, Montreal over Florida this, this, or tonight. Chicago beating St. Louis in the seventh and just underway L.A. and San Diego. The NBA playoffs have moved into the second round with the young Lakers visiting San Antonio tonight and trail one game to none in that series. And we check out game two in the opening half. Eddie Jones not intimidated by the Admiral in the paint at all. He gets the slam and the Lakers still trailed by five early. This one was back and forth all night long. The Lakers on the fast break and David Robinson rejects Anthony Peeler's shot. Then it's Robinson 
on the fast break. Sean Elliott ends it up with the two-hand slam. Spurs up by 13 in the second. This one would go into overtime with the Spurs winning in overtime, 97-90. to 90. Dennis Rodman, 22 points and 22 rebounds for the Spurs, who now lead that series two games to none. The quest for the Stanley Cup continue tonight, where it's playoff time in the NHL. In Philadelphia, the Flyers hosting Buffalo, where in Game 1, Philadelphia won in overtime without their star center, Eric Lindros. And Eric Lindros would be on the sidelines tonight. In the first period, Rod Brendamore takes the bounce off a of saber skate, and it's his first goal of the playoffs. 1-0 Philadelphia, and there's Eric sitting in the stands. As in the second, it's Brendamore again on the break. He finds Rob Demio for the one-timer. The play, or the Flyers up 3-0 and go on to beat Buffalo 3-1 and take a 2-0 lead in that series. Flyers goalie Ron Hextall had 29 saves to spark the Flyers' defense. Here's a check on the rest of the games in the NHL tonight. Pittsburgh beats Washington 5-3. New York over Quebec. Big to tie that series at one apiece. And one other game on the ice tonight. If we can check that score out. Nope, I guess we won't. We'll head back. The Minnesota Vikings are tightening their wallets this spring. In a move to save money, the Vikes released running back Terry Allen today. Allen returned back from knee surgery last year to rush for more than 1,000 yards to lead Minnesota. But according to the Vikings, his production dropped off somewhat in the second half of the season and his $1.5 million salary made him too expensive to keep. And a quick check, wet round. Uh, High school golf tournament this afternoon. Third round of the city tournament. O'Gorman with a big lead. Medalist Ashley Evans from OG 44. That fourth and final round is Wednesday at their Westward Ho. And hopefully it'll be a lot nicer than today on the links. Doesn't sound like it will, but no. we'll hope so. Thanks, John. In a moment, a happy ending to the story of a dog napped Tetley. A chihuahua comes home after payment of ransom. Next on KDLD News. <laughs> Maker of the number one selling brand of chainsaw worldwide. Also makes a full line of trimmers with enough power to handle almost any size job. It could be one of the more useful tools you'll ever own. Available in steel territory, starting at $79.95. Are delicate, mommies are dear. Mine cooks and cleans a lot, mine's always near. She's so sweet, she's tidy and kind. You don't have she's the same old mom. She washes, she knits to her wine. We don't have the same old gifts. You'll find savings throughout the store at Dayton's Mother's Day sale, now through Sunday. Today in the public schools. Katie Dorme wrote her last name without any help. Jessica Enya spun through the air with the greatest of ease. And Andrew Lopez discovered how to make an airplane soar with the wind. For every child with dreams. For all parents with a dream for their children. The public schools are where small miracles happen every day. In Chevrolet's open house at your Heartland Chevy dealer, time to take a little spin. In Motor Trend Magazine's Truck of the Year, the 95 Chevy Blazer. Blazer comes standard with V6, automatic, airbag, four-wheel analog brakes, air conditioning, four-wheel drive, child security, 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. With all that going for it, Blazer's still over 3,000 less than Explorer. The one that isn't Truck of the Year. The award. The winner. Blazer at your Heartland Chevy dealer. Finally tonight, we have the Dog Gonda story out of New York. A tiny chihuahua is back home tonight after being dognapped. Tetley was riding in a duffel bag. Her owners carry her around in when Saturday on the subway, somebody snatched the satchel and took off. Glenn Edwards offered a $1,000 reward. No questions asked for Tetley's return. Well, today, a woman in Harlem phoned to say she bought the dog for $20. She realized it was Tetley after seeing news reports. The woman called the Edwards family, got the reward, and returned Tetley. 
and he looks pretty happy tonight. <laughs> he looked happy to be <laughs> home tonight. Uh, we're looking for some tough weather out there. Yeah, earlier we just mentioned the fact that there was a tornado warning just south of Omaha. Now just coming in a small stream flood advisory for Aurora, Douglas, and Davison counties reports of up to three and a third inches of rain in just the last three hours. So please don't try to cross any roads in that area with a dangerous flooding situation. Let's pay attention. Stay alert. Definitely. That's it for now. We'll be back tomorrow, 5 to 10. Till then, have a good night. Jay Leno's next with The Tonight Show. Good night. Counties lost roads and bridges, and homeowners suffered damage to their homes in rising water. Already the rainfall this spring has South Dakotans looking toward the federal government for relief from Mother Nature. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, has people in South Dakota this week surveying damage already caused by the spring storms. Governor Bill Janklo says he's glad they are here and they don't have far to look to find damage from the rain. I flew up to Aberdeen last evening for an announcement of a new business and as we were, as we broke through the clouds at about uh, 1,900, 2,000 feet, uh, northeast of Aberdeen there was honestly more water than there was land in sight. I've, I'm 55 years old and I've never seen anything like this. I, I mean, I'm serious, they've never seen anything like this. It literally looks like the Florida Everglades without the vegetation. Farmers are finding it nearly impossible to plant a crop this spring, and every day more eastern South Dakota counties declare a local disaster. Well, wetlands are places where there is sometimes or often a small pond. Government restrictions keep farmers from draining those wetlands in order to provide a habitat for wildlife. And as you might expect, those regulations are not popular with many farmers. But as John Austin found out today, the abundance of wetlands this year might be keeping the prairie from flooding worse than it is. The federal government has contracted over 8,000 wetland preservation easements with South Dakota farmers, 75% of them on small sloughs and marshes dry more years than wet. To remain qualified for the federal farm program, producers can farm the ground when they can, but they may not dig ditches to drain the wetlands in an effort to get an earlier start on planting. Recent decisions by ag and environmental officials to relax regulations are getting understandably high marks from politicians and producers hard pressed by this wet spring. Farmers are stewards of the soil and they're not going to be, you know, there's areas that you can drain, that you can farm without any problem. Some of this wetland out there that they farm eight out of 10 years uh, doesn't raise any ducks on it anyway and probably should have never been wetland. We're not just talking about ducks. We're talking about the watersheds and the ability of those watersheds to store water. The place the watershed stores water is in wetlands. You drain the wetlands and you create flooding. You don't prevent flooding by draining wetlands. It's a, it's a lose-lose and rather than a win-win situation. Farmer and former Brookings County Commissioner Don Larson carries his share of political bruises caused by the wetlands issue, but still hopes the majority of the current program will survive the 95 Congress. The thing of it is that we have to sit down as people involved in agriculture and also people involved in the environmental preservation of our country and work together so that we can facilitate any kind of a wetland or, or uh, restoration preservation program. Uh, it also uh, has its amenities and fits in with a modern agricultural system that we have today. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with farmers and the Ag Department to determine where short-term ditching and other temporary drainage solutions may be possible. Farmers with questions are urged to contact Consolidated Farm Services. In southern Brookings County, John Austin News 5. Tourism is South Dakota's second largest industry, second only to agriculture in new money brought into the state. But according to the White House Office of U.S. Travel and Tourism, there is even more South Dakota could do to bring those tourists in. Beth Fuller has the story on how the government reached out to lend a hand of expertise. Each year, more than 200,000 people visit the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum. Today, Under Secretary of Commerce for Travel, Greg Farmer, was one of them. Sioux Falls is just one stop on his cross-country tour. He's been giving cities and states ways they can attract more tourists. This is an industry about jobs. We're the second largest employer in America. Every 2.5 seconds in the world, a new job is created in the travel and tourism industry. Farmer says the good news is South Dakota doesn't have a bad image among tourists. 
but he says the state needs to work hard at promotion and raising awareness of what it has to offer. Conferences like we're having today to look at nine areas, everything from product development to research to the way we market ourselves, bring the industry together with the public sector to say, how do we show off what's so great about this area? He says states and regions should aim for international travelers coming from Europe and Asia, but cities like Sioux Falls should think domestic. Terry Ellis from the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce agrees. She says the city has a lot to offer visitors. People are on their way to the Black Hills, and what Sioux Falls has to continue to do more aggressively all the time is educate those travelers before they ever leave home that Sioux Falls is the best place to stop on the way west and that we're a perfect one day's drive. Farmer says highlighting destinations like Sioux Falls is the key to successful tourism because the more places travelers stop in the state, the more money they bring in. In Sioux Falls, Beth Fuller, News 5. The Brookings County Commission today cleared the way for construction of a new $30 million soybean processing plant near Volga. The board voted three to nothing to change the Volga plant site zoning to commercial. Two of the Brookings County Commissioners are stockholders in that proposed plant. They both abstained from the voting. The South Dakota Soybean Processors Cooperative plans to employ up to 70 people at the plant when it's finished, possibly by next year. The plant will crush soybeans and turn the raw products into soybean meal and oil to enhance their value in marketing. Well, coming up, some dramatic home video from two different states as severe weather plagues the Midwest. Next on News 5. Steel into the river. The body has not been found yet, and now Bell says the police forced him to falsely confess. At the time of Gina's disappearance, Bell lived in her neighborhood. In the O.J. Simpson double murder trial, today, prosecution professor of DNA was back on the stand explaining to the jury how DNA works in identifying a criminal suspect or a victim. But there was also an unusual development today, the blood of a still unidentified person inside Simpson's Bronco. John Gibson has the story. Testimony, there are only two particular samples that are involved. Up until now, the prosecution has said that O.J. Simpson's blood is mixed with the blood of both victims inside his Bronco. But now prosecutors have admitted there is also the blood of someone other than victims Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Frankly, that stain is a little bit different than the others as well because while consistent with Mr. Simpson, there's obviously another contributor that is not directly related or may not be directly related to this case on the steering wheel. Strangely, no screams from the defense table yet, though it seems likely they will seize on this result and perhaps link it to their theory of a mystery killer. The mystery blood aside, in testimony today, DNA expert Dr. Robin Cotton, Cotton showed the jury auto radiographs, pictures on film of the test results. But the actual DNA test results were held back until tomorrow. Instead, the jury got a lot of the prosecution's main point that just like the Mounties, DNA always gets its man or woman. There is no environmental force, there is no environmental effect that can work to simply change one type and make it become another. District Attorney Gil Garcetti said today he believes this DNA evidence is getting through to the jury. But you always rely as you do perhaps in any case on one, two, three, or, or more jurors who are going to be able to help others get through the process during deliberations. Another type of crime closer to home, a Brant, South Dakota man pleaded guilty this week in federal court to charges related to tampering with automobile odometers. 35-year-old Stephen Paul Burnt admitted altering the mileage readings on 66 different cars then mailing the car titles showing the lower odometer readings to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Federal prosecutors say the loss to consumers amounted to more than $119,000 overall. Burnt now faces up to five years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine or both for the scam. He will receive sentence on August 7th. One day a year, several Sioux Falls teachers move over in the classroom to let people from the community come in to become teachers for a day. So today, hundreds of kids found they had a new face helping them learn about reading, writing, and arithmetic, and other things, too. Cammie Melton has the story. 
instead of clipping on a microphone today, Sherry Kurtz pulled up a chair and taught some Axtell Park middle schoolers what it's like to be a KDLT anchor woman. But she also learned what it's like to be a student these days. Any kind of story? Can you yeah. choose what kind of story you read? Uh-uh. They give you a whole bunch of different kinds of stories, and they, like, give you parts of a story. Mm -hmm. and Sherry is a guest teacher for a day here with Mrs. Weasler's class, giving students a change of pace and an up-close and personal look at a professional in another field. But it's also a day of adult learning. It gives us a chance to, or the teacher a chance to, you know, see other jobs and see what other people are doing, and it also lets um, those people come in and meet our students. So. Jeremiah is wondering what he wants to do for a living. Today was a chance for him to narrow down the options. When you talk to them, they tell you about what they want to do, and then you're like, I don't know yet. If you want to do it, you can do it. And I, and I really enjoy the give and take and trying to make a difference in what we're doing. Next door, Dave Munson is taking the opportunity to get back into the classroom and explain to these sixth graders how and why he became a representative. I'm good at debating. I like to argue my points, and my mom said I'd be good at that, and so I decided that I'd ask him about that and see, because it'd probably be something I'd like. And Dave is learning how these students have changed since he was a teacher about 17 years ago. You're learning how the, what young people are like today, and you're seeing the different perspective. I think they're more open and more uh, willing to share with you know and ask you questions and so I, I just think there's more openness today and he's hoping these students will be open to his message of never giving up because dave says he believes that they can reach any goal if they work hard enough in sioux falls cammy melton news five the city of yankton has a new mayor and her honor's name is jean hunhoff hunhoff becomes the first woman ever to be mayor of yankton but she said today that's no big deal Jean Hunhoff replaces Terry Crandall, who decided not to seek re-election last year. The Yankton City Commission elected Jean Hunhoff to the mayoral job today. She is in her second term as a Yankton City Commissioner right now. The South Dakota Make-A-Wish Foundation is making a wish come true for itself with a dream home that will make dreams come true for some deserving kids in the future. The Make-A-Wish people broke ground today on an 1,100 square foot home in southwest Sioux Falls. The home, built by volunteer labor with totally donated materials, will sell for about $75,000. That money will then go into the Make-A-Wish Foundation Trust to provide money for two additional wishes every year for children suffering life-threatening diseases. And Make-A-Wish knows what most of the wishes from those kids will be. Disney World. Kids in South Dakota just uh, would do anything to go to Disney World, and most of them have never been there, never had an opportunity to go to, to Disney World. And uh, Disney World and Give Kids the World is a facility down there that really helps us in the cost of it. They kind of subsidize a little bit of it, too. Besides Disney World, Knipe says children's wishes include computers, toys, and playground equipment. Five children who had their wish come true already, along with Sioux Falls Mayor Gary Hansen, helped to break ground on the dream house today, the one that will make other dreams come true. Well, we can apparently count ourselves lucky to have to contend only with uh, daily deluges of rain these days. Look what the people around Auburn, Nebraska, near Omaha, faced last night. This incredible scene was taped on a home video camera by Rich Wilson. You can see two tornadoes touching down at the same time. The storms destroyed several buildings on nearby farms, but there were no injuries. The storms rumbled through the Auburn area at about 8 last night. And also, we have some more amateur video to show you tonight. This one, early tonight, a tornado touching down in northern Illinois. This dramatic home video shows the tornado just forming. There were as many as five like this one on the ground at any one time. The twisters turned over six tractor-trailer rigs and as many as 12 cars on Interstate 55. In Salisbury, Illinois, a mobile home was overturned. One person hurt there. At least six homes south of Athens destroyed. A school lost its roof. Utility poles, power lines all down, and the destruction spread through six Illinois counties. Mm. Whoever videotaped that has some nerves of steel, don't they? That's right. Uh, and also, we can add to that there are 26 other reports of tornadoes today. A very active day in the middle of the country, and we think things will quiet down. We'll try to talk about that and plus the weekend forecast after this. Centennial Carpets is moving to... Uh, certainly, in handling the dramatic... ...have a recovery, that sign-up uh, dates will uh, have some common sense to them, that we more fully uh, utilize our CRP acreage, that we have some loan repayment delay for farmers' home borrowers, uh, and as also that we work with the FEMA director to make sure that we have some consolidated strategy relative to disaster programs in South Dakota. 
Well, the state of South Dakota today set up a flood emergency hotline to try to help those affected by the high water to get some relief. Municipal officials and others with problems or emergencies arising from the flooding can call to get quick advice on what to do. The state plans to staff those phones from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening. The hotline number is 605-773-5058. And to make matters worse, the persistent rains are already putting numerous South Dakota road construction projects way behind schedule this spring. But as Scott Bowden reports, contractors say they are still confident they will meet their deadlines. I got a lot of people calling wanting to go back to work, but we just can't put them to work, and we're not the only contractor in town that's like that. Tim Nelson is the contracting supervisor for the Western Ave Interchange and the 57th Ave Tunnel projects. All the rain this spring has not only been slowing his operations down, but he says it's also hurting his employees. Well, it's hurting our people because we can't hire all our people back to keep them busy. We can't hire people from Sioux Falls to keep them busy, and uh, everything's just falling behind. The biggest problem for Nelson is this tunnel on 57th Street, which will soon link northern Lincoln County developments to Louise Avenue. The tunnel is the controlling operation on the job. It requires the most amount of work. And uh, with the mud, we can't access in there. We're in about the lowest area here in Sioux Falls, I think. And but Department of Transportation Engineer Steve Ramis is doing everything he can to help them out. We've pulled the crews off the tunnel, and they're working over on the structures. So hopefully we can get some of that work done early this year. So when we can get in the tunnel area, we can go full force over there and, and maybe catch up, maybe not. Ramis is confident these projects should be completed by their deadline of November 1st. It'll just mean when it does stop raining, workers will have to work extra hours to get it done. We work an average of a 10-hour day, but uh, we're going to have to go to 12s and hopefully we don't have to start working Saturdays and uh, it's just got the sun's got to shine. In Sioux Falls, Scott Bowden, News 5. And as though driving through water, running water, were not bad enough, this brings pothole problems in the streets is still a pain for motorists. As Beth Fuller tells us tonight, if you thought potholes were only an early spring problem, think again. Signs of spring are everywhere. Some you see, others you feel. Usually by this time of year, pothole problems fade away with other winter unpleasantries. But thanks to recent rainfall, the hot mix of asphalt and aggregate isn't sticking the way it should. And almost as soon as they're patched, the mix is worn away. I think we've been doing quite a job filling them every day. And we will uh, fix them more permanently come summer. The state is responsible for main streets like Minnesota and part of Cliff and East Tenth. And for weeks, state crews have been working day and night, sun or snow, to make travel smoother for motorists. So until we get more consistent cooperation from Mother Nature, the surest sign of spring may be a flashing yellow arrow. In Sioux Falls, Beth Fuller, News 5. In a moment, a mystery illness invades Minnesota. It's a rash, it's a respiratory problem, but what is it? Coming up next on News 5. Does the concrete in your garage, driveway, or business look like this? Are there oil stains, cracks, deterioration from road salts, and damage from freeze-thaw conditions? Do you have a dusting problem? Constant exposure to these elements can force you to replace your concrete unless you do preventive maintenance to protect it. Concrete Image Maintainers wants to help you by sealing your concrete before it becomes a problem. Remember, concrete isn't indestructible. Protect your investment and avoid replacement costs. Call Concrete Image Maintainers. Come into Ben-Hur Ford's extended $10 million inventory clearance sale. Last month's sale was such a success that we're bringing in even more inventory from other Ford dealers. And we're stretching the savings for two more weeks. Buy America's best-selling truck, Ford F-Series, at 4.9%. Buy or lease an F-Series and get $750 cash back. Hurry in today or find out more by calling 1-800-NEW-FORD. Working hard at treating you right McKinnon Hospital's Caring for Life series presents this medical moment. Death from trauma is more likely to occur in the country than in the city. And that's why acting quickly when someone is injured could mean the difference between life and death. The Verified Trauma Center at McKinnon Hospital knows how important time is. Our trauma team is waiting for a patient when they arrive, conserving life-saving seconds. If trauma strikes, ask to go to the Verified Trauma Center at McKinnon Hospital. This medical moment is brought to you by McKinnon Hospital because we care about your life. 
Minnesota, which already in recent months had to contend with a bacteria in ice cream, an outbreak of meningitis, and a rash of deadly strep infections, now has a new one, a mystery illness. This one in Wilmer, Minnesota, is forcing school officials to take some drastic action. Rick Cupcella reports. Five-year-old Grace Swank is out of school today. The Early Childhood Learning Center in Wilmer is closed. No hands for the puppets, no eyes for the books, and no idea when things will get better. All we know is the people here just kept getting sick. But the ones that haven't have really gotten zapped. Ron Werner shared this office with three secretaries, every one of whom took ill. Respiratory problems started shortly after carpet installation. They changed the carpet, but they all stayed sick. In addition to the respiratory problems, they've now developed rashes, skin irritations like bug bites that began to spread, first to different parts of the body, then to different members of the family. School officials moved to shut the place down for fear it would spread to the kids. We didn't want to take a chance of students uh, breaking out with rashes, uh, and we just felt we needed to call additional experts in to do some further uh, specific testing. The victims have been to multiple specialists. They've relayed the carpet and sprayed for bugs and literally froze the children's textbooks to kill any possible mold. Tests have been run throughout the Twin Cities and Washington, D.C. and Canada. Still, nobody knows what's wrong. That is weird. It is weird. It is, uh, the, the word we use is bizarre. It is absolutely bizarre. The illness, which apparently is not life-threatening, is not going away either. So the kids had to. You can't fight what you don't know. Well, I think it's good because I wouldn't want my children to be, you know, susceptible to any kind of bugs or anything like that. So far, no children are infected with the mystery disease, but school is probably out for the rest of the year. A fire broke out tonight at about 6 in the upstairs of 816 South Glendale in Sioux Falls, and it's put a woman and her three children out of their home. When firefighters arrived, they found smoke coming from the upstairs and the people at home at the time out safely. There was a problem initially attacking the fire because of limited access to the interior. Firefighters had the flames under control in about 20 minutes, though. Nobody was hurt, and the Red Cross is taking care of the family of three out of the home tonight. This week, national statistics on home sales across America had some good Melton reports. They're coming back with higher prices locally. Fewer houses are being sold, but the ones that are getting off the market have a larger price tag attached to them. That's what the first quarter figures are showing not only in this state and region, but across the country. January through March, the sales rate of existing South Dakota homes was down more than 6%, but realtors say that doesn't mean our housing market isn't strong. Some parts are just flatter uh, like than others. This price range from 60 to 90 has been extremely active. Uh, then the next phase from probably 90 to 120 is also uh, a, a good price range right now, but that upper price range has been off a little bit, and so that's where we're probably seeing somewhat of our decrease in numbers from a year ago. Although the annual sales rate of existing homes in South Dakota did decrease for the first couple months of this year, experts say that will be turned around because South Dakota and especially Sioux Falls have a stable economy and strong job growth and those are the keys to a healthy housing market. And the new figures already reflect that because although South Dakota house prices are also up, actually the 10th highest increase in the country, our prices aren't up as much as the national or regional average. Our market here seems to remain strong. We've had new businesses coming in. Uh, our demand for housing stays real positive and I think that we're just seeing uh, last year when rates did go up, uh, we saw things kind of fall off a little bit, and that came into 1995. But right now, coming into the spring, summer of this year, I think we're going to see a real strong market. Cook says he expects the second quarter figures to be as good as last year or better. In Sioux Falls, Cammy Melton, News 5. The government charged a second man today with the bombing of the federal building three weeks ago in Oklahoma City that killed 167 people. Terry Nichols, who until recently was just a material witness in the case, appeared in court today, and his son and ex-wife will appear soon before a federal grand jury. Jim Hanchett has more on that story from El Reno, Oklahoma. The hearing only lasted about 15 minutes. Terry Nichols told his rights and the charges he faces. The FBI says Nichols helped his old army buddy, Timothy McVeigh, carry out the bombing, and he could, if convicted, face execution. Due to the fact that there was loss of life in and around the Murrah building, is the death penalty. The hearing being held in a makeshift courtroom in the visitation area at the federal prison in El Reno. It is the same room where McVeigh made his last public appearance. Both men will be held in the prison here but in separate areas. Nichols was not asked to enter a plea. 
And as with McVeigh, he said little. We didn't notice any reaction on the part of uh, Nichols at all. He, he simply looked straight ahead. Uh, FBI agents said a search of Nichols Harrington, Kansas home turned up detonator cords, blasting caps, and ground up ammonium nitrate, similar to the materials used in the bombing. Investigators also say they found anti-government literature and blue plastic barrels that match fragments found at the federal building. Nichols' ex-wife, Lana Padilla, is in Oklahoma City, meanwhile. She is expected to testify before a grand jury investigating the case. And the couple's 12-year-old son, Joshua, is not believed to be involved in the bombing, although the FBI is checking whether he could be that suspect, John Doe number 2, and whether he was with McVeigh when that Ryder truck was rented. Four survivors of the blast are suing the company that may have made the fertilizer used in the bomb. Their lawyer, O.J. Simpson attorney, Johnny Cochran. The lawsuit alleges the firm failed to reduce the explosive potential of the product. Well, in the meantime, the other suspect in the case, Tim McVeigh, refuses to talk, calling himself a political prisoner. Well, the prosecution in the O.J. Simpson trial today put up its smoking gun in an effort to prove that the former football great killed his former wife and her friend last summer. The blood evidence today carried with it enormously long odds that Simpson was the killer, that was the testimony today. Numbers, big numbers that implicate O.J. Simpson. John Gibson has more. Judge Ito was trying to get the lawyer's attention and they weren't I giving it to him. Oh, Herb Counselor sanctioned $250. Get your check with that. A chastened defense attorney, Peter Neufeld, wrote a check. Woody Clark got cash from prosecutor Chris Darden. I'm not going to tolerate that kind of stuff anymore. Are we clear? March over to the court, both of you. This outburst from Judge Ito came only 45 minutes after the judge told the jury to ignore comments from the bench that those comments are not evidence in this case. Earlier, O.J. Simpson took a long and close look at the auto radiographs that say he is the killer. The crucial blood spot that was identified as O.J. Simpson's is from the Bundy crime scene. The DNA expert on the stand, Dr. Robin Cotton, said that almost the entire population of the U.S. would have to be searched to find a person other than Simpson who matches. The blood spot on the sock, said to be Nicole Simpson's, carries with it numbers even worse for O.J. Simpson. And that is one in 6.8 billion. The defense counter to this very damaging information is the long-expected contamination and or frame-up theory. Well, uh, the weather tonight, is it going to hold? That's what everybody wants to know. It was a superb day, and looks like half of tomorrow will be nice, but it uh, looks like after that it goes downhill. We'll be back at the forecast after you look at the address for Cook's Weather Pick. Jobs are easier with Wagner from Menards. The self-feeding paint roller speeds up painting and cleaning, now $29.99. The seven-piece sprayer kit sprays paints and stains on sale for $73. Improve the look of your lawn with NK Lawn Seed. Prevail or Northland Lawn Seed is made to withstand drought and stress with easy care, just $5.95 each. Menards is the right choice for home improvement needs. Save big money at Menards. In Aberdeen, it's a budding rock band. In Huron, it's their first batch of cookies. In Yankton, there are 520 people who call it a living. All across the Great Plains, we serve thousands of people in ways that make their lives easier, more rewarding, and more productive. You can call it fun. Call it work. Call it security. Call it breakfast. Call it what you will. We call it service. We're here for you. We're Northwestern Public Service Company. Deals you like from people you can trust. Rat Chevrolet in Marion, the place to go for the new line of Chevrolets, like the hot new Camaro and the sporty practical Cavalier. Rap Chevrolet also has a great selection of late model GM program and off-lease vehicles. Chevrolets, Pontiacs, Velux, and Cadillacs. You can find used in program vans, like these all-wheel drive Chevy Astros. You need a truck? Rap Chevrolet has great deals on all sizes. The deals you like from people you can trust. Rap Chevrolet in Marion, South Dakota. Hi, I'm Sandy with Sandy's Collection for Talls in the Western Mall. I start off my day with the Today Show on KDLT. What a difference today makes. Later on the Tonight Show, Jay's got a great idea for Pulp Fiction Samuel L. Jackson and Garth Brooks. What if you guys switch hats? That'd be kind of a look. <laughs> 
just said, it's Garth unplugged in a rare acoustic performance. Plus, Supermodel Vendela and Supermodel Mania with Alexandra Wentworth. It's Thursday Night Fever, followed by an all-new Conan NBC tonight. Well, superb weather today, and looks like we have a suber superb Cook's weather pick for tonight. Take a look at this one from Jessica Jensen, out of the flight deck of an S3 Bravo. She was flying up above Rio de Janeiro when this cloud was taken. That is a cumulus congestus. That is the name of that type of cloud. A lot of stratiform look to it, kind of some fuzziness on the top. It's look a little bit like a giant cotton ball. Current conditions in Sioux Falls, we're looking at skies to be partly cloudy. 55 degrees, 46 is our dew point. A light southerly breeze at 9, and our pressure is down to 29.76. Out of Rapid City, their pressure already down to 29.53. Things will be dropping in the pressure throughout the day tomorrow as a new storm gathers in strength and pressures drop, and re we see an increase in the amount of cloud cover across the area. 55 in Huron right now, skies are mostly clear. 53 in Aberdeen, 58 in Pier, 57 with thunder now in the air in Rapid City, and 54 Sioux City, and 51 in Worthington, Minnesota. Daytime high is 66 in Sioux Falls, 72 in Minneapolis. We were one of the cool spots across the region, but we will get close to the 70s tomorrow, despite the fact there will be more clouds moving in. Overnight lows last night, this was not 72 in Bismarck, should have been about 42. 40 in Sioux Falls, 42 in Minneapolis, 44 in Casper, Wyoming, and we'll look for lower to mid 50s tonight across most of the state. Well, it was a record setting spring across many areas of eastern South Dakota. Some of those spots, of course, we don't have records from, but for those we do, Mitchell, 11.4 inches of rain in the first four months of spring. Highmore, 9.9 .9 inches. Again, these were records for the first four months. And Sioux Falls, we are nearing a record of two, are to be the wettest spring so far. 2.3 inches is all we need, and we will hit the wettest springs ever in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Scattered showers and thunderstorms now erupting across western Nebraska. Those are moving northeastward, so here, let's say Mobridge, you may in see a shower towards morning, and here in eastern South Dakota, let's say Watertown, Aberdeen, parts of Huron and down to Sioux Falls, we should stay dry until probably mid-afternoon tomorrow when those clouds do come in and affect our forecast. Cloud started to evaporate late this evening. It was a pleasant one. Temperatures in the mid to upper 50s. Now skies clearing out across most of the state, but clouds do increase once you get west of, let's say, Rapid City. Again, they are reporting thunder at this hour in Rapid City. Severe weather is possible anytime Friday night into early Saturday morning across eastern South Dakota, eastern Nebraska, and northwest Iowa. By the time the west of the re weekend does come around, looks like that will all shift east into Iowa, and cooler weather will stick in across the Rockies as the jet stream stays far to the south for this time of the year, and still all the warm and delightful dry weather that is sitting across the east coast with temperatures in the 70s and 80s. Take a look at the rest of the country. Strong showers and thunderstorms erupting tonight across southern Mississippi and Alabama. Still flash flood watches in effect down there. And there was even severe weather today in northeast Wyoming and southeast Montana. Sheridan, Wyoming had a possible tornado today. And Lodge, Gra Lodge Grass, Montana also tornado touchdown near that region. That severe weather could be in our backyard late tomorrow afternoon and into early Saturday morning. It is all being caused by a new area of low pressure now consolidating across the plains. These two right here, they're going to team up together and increase the strength of this storm system. More showers and storms lighting up the skies tomorrow More what we call plain pounders. Lots of rain falling from the skies late tomorrow afternoon. Even some snow in the forecast for the Black Hills on Saturday afternoon. And we will see scattered hit and miss rain showers across our region late in the day. Tomorrow daytime highs upper 60s east and mainly the 70s across the rest of the state. For tonight, partly cloudy. We'll call it strangely quiet. 51 degrees, the wind southeast at 5 to 15. More showers and thunderstorms likely by late tomorrow afternoon. 67, the wind's howling south, 15 to 35. Showers and storms tomorrow night. Some of those locally severe, 54, the wind south at 15 to 25. Here's your extended forecast showing rain continuing on Saturday, 62 degrees, and then looks like we'll finally dry out for a couple days. 57 on Sunday, a cool one and windy. And then Monday, 65 degrees. So looking pretty good, but does get wet next week. Real wet? Could be. Could be. Of course, could be. The North Central Conference met on the baseball diamond this afternoon in Sioux Falls. That's coming up next, but first, here's a fishing tip from Art Perry. Now's the time to brush up on your skills with fishing tips from Inland Yachts. You know, a lot of people think a jig is just a jig. 
but there's certain jigs that have different style heads to them, like the swimming fuzzy grub. A uh, prime example would be that each one of these type of jigs is designed for a different, different type of fishing when you're out on the lake. So take a look at the packaging and look at the head and find yourself a head that will apply to the type of fishing that you're doing. It's time to stock up on tackle with a visit to the area's best source for boating and fishing supplies, Inland Yachts. There's family boating fun that fits in your garage and your budget. The Johnson Powered Play Buoy from Inland Yachts. It's compact family fun, like me. The Johnson Powered Play Buoy can be pulled by small cars and trucks, so you can take it with you on vacation. It really widens your horizons. Powered by a spirited Johnson outboard, the Play Buoy is just $59.95, plus freight and rigging. Where else can the whole family have so much fun? The Johnson Powered Play Buoy from Inland Yachts. Last time we were here was when I proposed. Ten years. It seems like only yesterday. I told you then how much I loved you. And nothing's changed. The Diamond Anniversary Band. On your tenth, show her you'd marry her all over again. Does the concrete in your garage, driveway, or business look like this? Are there oil stains, cracks, deterioration from road salts, and damage from freeze-thaw conditions? Do you have a dusting problem? Constant exposure to these elements can force you to replace your concrete unless you do preventive maintenance to protect it. Concrete Image Maintainers wants to help you by sealing your concrete before it becomes a problem. Remember, concrete isn't indestructible. Protect your investment and avoid replacement costs. Call Concrete Image Maintainers. From Johnny to Jerry, Bette Midler guest stars on an all-new Seinfeld next Thursday. Later on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Tracy Lord. John Doe number two in the Oklahoma City bombing. A two-year fugitive from the Springfield State Prison is arrested in New York State, and an Aberdeen teen is caught with a gun at school. Details are next. You're watching Katie. Well, tonight arrested Stephen Garrett Colburn, a man sought in connection with the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building three and a half weeks ago. Well, that arrest came in the Arizona town of Oatman. FBI agents say Colburn may have been the man driving a brown pickup that was traveling in tandem with primary bombing suspect Timothy McVeigh the day of the blast. But as Phil Schumann reports, Colburn's father says it can't be true. Until somebody shows me, I don't believe my son was involved in that. So. Robert Colburn, a well-respected Oxnard dentist, greeted the news with disbelief that his son may have somehow been involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Steve has always been a gentle person who has not hurt anyone as far as we know. We never had any problems with him. And we do not think he ever had any problems with the law. Stephen Garrett Colburn has had problems, both personal and with the law. Brought up in Oxnard, the one-time Eagle Scout graduated from Oxnard High School in 1978, a straight-A student. He was very cooperative. Uh, he was never a problem. He was very cooperative. He went on to UCLA, leaving with a degree in biochemistry. He was later employed at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center doing DNA research. But things began to unravel for Colburn in the late 80s. There was a divorce, then bankruptcy. Then a 1994 arrest on a weapons charge. He eventually skipped bail and became a fugitive. His last contact with his family was on September 17, 1994, at the wedding of his sister. Family members have lost complete contact with the man since then, but steadfastly refuse to believe he has had anything to do with Timothy McVeigh. No, I don't believe it. You know, I, I just, uh, it appears to me that somebody's looking for a patsy. The death toll in the Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing rose again tonight, incidentally, up now to 168. A man hospitalized for his injuries suffered in the bombing April 19th died tonight. 56-year-old Gary Heineman, who escaped two years ago from the Springfield State Prison Guards while speaking to high school students in Hurley, is back behind bars tonight in New York State. Police in Hamburg, New York, arrested Heineman last night, who identified himself as Robert Lee Dixon. Heineman allegedly broke into a Catholic high school in Buffalo, and when police searched his car, they found five garbage bags full of chalices and other valuable artifacts some of which were stolen from chapels at West Point last week. 
The value of the stolen church property is estimated at about a quarter of a million dollars. Police in Pennsylvania also suspect Heinemann in the theft of $80,000 worth of church property there. Heinemann was serving time for second-degree burglary at the Springfield State Prison when he escaped in April of 1993 while on a visit with students in Hurley. And many Aha County jail deputies say they thwarted a jail break last night when they heard pounding noises coming from one of the cells. When they investigated, they report Jose Angel Garza was trying to chip concrete away from his cell window, apparently trying to break out. Garza is the man police arrested in February following a fire in an apartment house on South Spring Avenue in Sioux Falls. Garza allegedly set the fire after an argument with some people inside. The fire killed a man who has not yet been positively identified. Police say that dead man was an illegal alien who had fake identification. Garza, who could face the death penalty if convicted for arson and murder, is now in an isolation jail cell at the Minnehaha County Jail following the alleged jailbreak. A 14-year-old student at Aberdeen Central High School will face charges in juvenile court after being found with a small caliber handgun at school today. Aberdeen police say they confiscated the weapon at Aberdeen High this morning. So far, there is no information available on why the student had the gun, but police say the student made no threats. State Health Department employees plan an undercover investigation to find out which stores in South Dakota sell tobacco products to minors. The plan is to send underage people into various stores to try to purchase tobacco products. The legislature last year increased the penalty for selling tobacco to anyone under 18. That violation is now punishable with a $200 fine and 30 days in jail. The State Health Department says the undercover operation is necessary to preserve $400,000 in federal money for drug and alcohol problems. The Farmore Discount Drug Store will close in Sioux Falls. Farmore is under bankruptcy protection right now. After the store closing of the Sioux Falls store and 40 others, the company will be left with 102 stores in 19 states. The Farmore in Sioux Falls is in the Western Mall. Car washes and laundromats in Aberdeen will have to shut down operation for a while to try to reduce the load on the overworked Aberdeen sewer system. The mayor ordered the shutdown today in the wake of heavy rains earlier this week that endangered the operation of the city's sanitary sewer system. Mayor Tim Rich has asked residents also to not use any more water than absolutely necessary in Aberdeen during the crisis. In a moment, the cost of a hospital stay keeps rising. But locally, health care officials say it's not as bad as it could be. Next on News 5. What happens when you take the best-selling trucks in America and customize them for the best place to live? You get the Northland Edition F-150s. These trucks come with two-tone clear coat paint, custom wheels and tires, special Northland markings, and air conditioning at no extra charge. Now for a limited time with a special 750 cashback bonus, lease this loaded XLT for $169 a month. So look for the mark of the Northland Edition F-150s. The best trucks to drive in the best place to live. How will you know when the right insurance company comes along? Will it be the one who claims to see the farthest? Will it be the one who says they have the 